On our first part of our test review, we are looking to see whether or not we are continuous or discontinuous, and we need to know if we are discontinuous, what type of discontinuity and the place of it. So for number one, even though we have a point highlighted here, we are still continuous. So that one was pretty easy. Number two, notice we do have a discontinuity and this is a jump and it is a location at x equals two. Okay, and then number three, this type of discontinuity is an infinite discontinuity and the location of this would be at x equals five. Right, continuing on to number four, this would be a continuous function. No holes or gaps there. Number five is a discontinuous and it looks like we have an infinite again. And that occurs at x equals three. And finally, our last problem, we are discontinuous and we have a jump and the location of that jump is at x equals 2. The next part of this we need to talk about the end behaviors of each graph. So as we list this out, keep in mind we do have to start with x approaches positive or negative infinity. Our function itself, our f of x, is approaching positive infinity for this particular problem. So as x is continuing to increase without bound, the y values are continuing to increase without bound. And then if we talk about x approaching negative infinity, so as x is moving negatively, our y values, again on this side, they are approaching positive infinity. Over here with number eight, as x approaches negative infinity, our function itself, f of x, is approaching negative infinity as well. So as x is approaching negative infinity, so are the y values. And then as x approaches positive infinity, it looks like our y values are also approaching positive infinity. Finally, number nine, as x approaches negative infinity, our f of x values are also approaching negative infinity. And then we have as x approaches positive infinity, our y values are still approaching negative infinity. The next part of this, we are looking to see whether or not our function is symmetrical about the x-axis, the y-axis origin. So looking at the graph, it looks like we would probably be symmetric about the y-axis, but we can also investigate this and we do need to verify our answers algebraically. So I think this would be y-axis. Now to go through each one of these, which is what we need to do to review this. So to be with the x-axis, we need to substitute in a negative y value. So we would have x squared minus y equals seven. Well, that sure does not look like what we had started with. So that's definitely not gonna be symmetric about the x-axis. So let's look at the y-axis, and the y-axis says substitute in a negative x to see if we maintain that same function. And notice here when we square that negative x, it becomes positive x squared minus y equals seven, which is indeed what we started with. So we are symmetric about the y-axis. Now we do need to check the origin because there are some problems that would be symmetric about each individual part. So with the origin, we would do our substitution for both x and we would also do a substitution for y. 
And so that's going to give me here equal to 7. And notice we did not come back to the original. And this should have been y earlier, or positive y. All right. So it looks like we're not symmetric about the origin, so we are finished. Okay, for the next part, filling in the blanks here. We were told that if a function is even, the graph is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. And that also implies that f of negative x is equal to f at x. And then if a function is odd, the graph is um, symmetric with respect to the origin. And f at negative x is equal to the opposite of the original function, or negative f at x. Alright, so we need to decide whether or not these functions are even, odd, or neither. And we're going to do that by looking at, first, how it's graphed. So notice here with the very first one, we're not really symmetric about anything there. So that one's going to be neither. For this next one here, we are symmetric about the y-axis. So that would mean that we are even. Here, we're not symmetric about either axis or the origin, so neither. Um, for the next one, notice that we are symmetric about the origin, so this would be odd. The same is true here. Notice that we are symmetric about the origin. And finally, even this last one. This looks strange. This is a step function but it is also symmetric about the origin, so it is also odd. Okay, now we need to determine algebraically whether our function is even or odd. So let's see, we've got to go through our tests, and so we need to check f at negative x. All the tests start with that. So I have negative x all cubed minus a negative x. And when this is simplified, we have negative x cubed plus x. And when we compare that up here to our original, it is not the same, so we're not even. So let's check to see if we are odd. So odd means that what we just found would match the opposite of the original function. So that means I'm going to take a negative and multiply it to you the original function, and when I simplify that, I have negative x cubed plus x, and that does match what we found earlier. So this is going to be an odd function. Okay, looking at number 14, again, all of these do start out with evaluating f at negative x, and so we have negative x all squared minus 6 and when we simplify this we have positive x squared minus 6 and that is the function that we started with so this function would be even number 15 same process so let's start with f at negative x so I have negative x all cubed minus negative x and minus 2 so we need to simplify here. We have negative x cubed plus x minus 2. And when we compare that to our original, it is not the same. So now we've got to look at the opposite of f at x. And so we are going to multiply every term of the original by a negative. And so that's going to give me negative x cubed positive x and positive 2. That is not what we got here. It's almost the same, but the sign of 2 is different. So this one would be a neither. It's neither even nor odd. And finally, number 16, same process. So let's find f at negative x. So we're going to have negative x to the fourth minus the negative x. All of this is over negative x to the fifth 
minus a negative x. Simplifying, we have x to the fourth, positive x in the denominator, negative x to the fifth, and positive x again. So we definitely did not get back the original, so we're not even. So now let's check for the opposite of the original. So multiplying every single term by a negative. So positive x to the fourth is now negative x to the fourth. Negative x is now positive x. Denominator, negative x to the fifth and positive x. And notice that did generate what we got when we substituted in a negative x. So this function would be odd. Alright, so for our next example, we need to find the average rate of change of an object that is being thrown upward with initial velocity of 48 feet per second from a height of 120 feet. The height of the object um, t seconds after it is thrown is given by this function. So for part A, we need to find the average velocity in the first two seconds after the object is thrown. So to get an idea of what this would look like, if our ball is thrown from 120 feet up in the air, so it's going to look something like this. And so initially, we're starting up here. We're starting at zero time. So that's going to be at 120 feet. So 0, 120. And then we want to know where is the ball or whatever it is being thrown after two seconds. So we'll have to evaluate that. So our time frame is from zero to two. So the setup of this problem would be h at two minus h at zero all over two minus zero. And if you evaluate h at 2, you're going to get 152 minus the initial height of 120, or substitute in 0 into your function. So you're going to end up with 32 over 2, or you're going to have 16, and our units would be feet per second. So that's our average rate of change over the first two seconds. And likewise, here on part B, we're going to find the average velocity. And now our time is from 2 to 4. So again, we will set up the problem. We have h at 4 minus h at 2. And all of that's over 4 minus 2. And so our rate of change here at h at 4 is going to be 56 minus h at 2 was 120, and that is all over 2. So this is going to give us negative 32 feet per second. All right, on number 18, we need to uh, make a slight change to the problem. Instead of 50, let's make this 150. That should um, help us see things a little bit better on our graph, if we need to graph it. Um, so we need to find the average velocity in the first two seconds after the object is thrown. So with our first two seconds, So our time interval is going to be from 0 to 2. And so we need to set up our problem. We have h at 2 minus h at 0. And all of that's over 2 minus 0. So we need to find h at 2. And when we do, we're going to have 150 minus h at 0. is going to be 150 and that's going to be all over 2. So strangely enough, if you notice what's happened here, our average rate of change is going to be a 0. 
So we had not a much average rate of change there. All right, now let's travel on to two seconds and four seconds. So we're looking at the interval from two to four. And so again, we're going to sub in our formula. We have h at four minus h at two, and that's gonna be all over four minus two. So h at four, once we find that out in our calculators, we're gonna have 22 minus 150, and that's all over two. So our final answer is gonna be negative 64, and that again is gonna be feet per second.